Uh, uh, my name's Jane Fernandez. I'm a provost here at UNC Asheville. And uh, we're very happy to see many of you uh, from UNC Asheville and visitors here for UNC Asheville's first ever Disabilities Week. To kick off this week, we have um, distinguished speaker, Dr. I. King Jordan, um, who's with us tonight, and will be making a presentation called The Deaf Community at, at a Crossroads. Many of you know that Dr. Jordan uh, became the first deaf president of Gallaudet University. During the Civil War, the middle of the Civil War, <laughs> President Abraham Lincoln signed a charter that established Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. as the first and still only uh, university exclusively for deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind students. For uh, 124 years after President Lincoln signed the charter, 124 years, every president of Gallaudet was a hearing man. Until 1988, when after a social movement, the board of Gallaudet chose him as first deaf president. He continued for 19 years. And in this time, for a um, college president to stay in office for 19 years is long and very impressive commitment to a university and to the students that the university serves. Right after he was elected president, he had a pivotal role in um, fostering the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We understand that without his advocacy, the ADA was really dead in Congress. And his selection as the first deaf president inspired our United States Congress representatives and senators to pull the ADA back up and pass it. That resulted in many improvements and a lot of um, more equality in many ways for people with disabilities, including deaf people. While at Gallaudet, he oversaw a tremendous period of change and improvement in technology and ways that deaf people use technology. Uh, in terms of quality of education for deaf and hard of hearing students, both at Gallaudet and in the education delivered at schools with deaf children throughout the United States. He oversaw a commitment to fostering respect for differences among deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind people, and to including all people on the campus of Gallaudet University. He, um, had the honor and privilege to serve three United States presidents. President George Bush appointed him as the vice chair of the President's Committee on Employment of People with Disabilities. And President Bill Clinton reappointed him in the same role. And our current President Barack Obama also appointed him to the White House Commission on Presidential Scholars. So he's a great uh, history maker and a worldwide icon for what deaf people and people with disabilities can do. So uh, please give him a warm welcome.
Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Thank you very much. Wow. Good evening. Good evening. Big crowd. Wow. I'm really impressed with the number of people in the room. And I'm also impressed with the mix of people. I came to Asheville four years ago, almost exactly four years ago. I came and I spoke in a different building, in a different room, but the audience was different too. So I'm happy to see the mix of people from the university and from outside the university. I'm happy to be back. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm joined today and four years ago also, I was joined by my wife, Linda. October is a very special month for us because we celebrate our anniversary in October. And two weeks ago on Friday, we celebrated our 44th wedding anniversary. So happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. <clears throat> I need to thank Jane Fernandez, especially for inviting me back. We stay in touch, but mainly on email. And I don't know about you, but for me, email works like uh, this. Back and forth, back and forth, back. A long way. <laughs> then back and forth, back and forth, back. Then a long way. So sometimes it's maybe six weeks or eight weeks or more between our email communications. And then, all of a sudden, every day, two or three times every day, we're uh, in touch with each other. Technology really has changed the world for communication and for deaf people. And that's great. <clears throat> I said I was here four years ago. Shortly after I left four years ago, I started to do some research with a colleague who was a social work professor at Gallaudet. She and I had known each other for a long time and were very interested in changes that were happening in the deaf community and changes that were happening in technology and how some of those changes didn't seem to be smooth and working together the way we thought they could or should be working. And changes like in the deaf community, there's real stronger culture and recognition of American Sign Language, both within the deaf community and outside the deaf community. More and more people now are learning sign language. More and more people are getting credit for learning sign language in schools and colleges and universities. That's really great, but it's probably changing sign language a little bit. People in the deaf culture don't want sign language to change, don't want it to be influenced by what's going on outside. Technology, ooh, big, big, fast changes in technology. The uh, simplest one to point to is cochlear implant. Now the FDA has approved cochlear implants in babies one year old, so 12 months. If you have special rationale, you can get permission to implant at nine months. So imagine what impact that will have on deaf community, deaf culture, deaf education. So we want to look at technology, what's happening outside the deaf community, look at deaf culture, what's happening inside the deaf community. We published a really interesting paper, I think, and uh, that's in the Journal of Disability in Social Work. And it's called The Deaf Community at a Crossroads. That's why I titled my talk tonight. I, I will borrow from the research we did. I will talk about uh, diversity. I will talk about diversity two ways. I'll talk about diversity in general, the way Everybody talks about diversity, 
And while I'm doing that, I'll insist that deafness and disability be included in that definition of diversity. Frequently, when people define diversity, they talk about racial issues, ethnic issues, maybe uh, nationality, religion, but the issues of disability and deafness don't come up all the time. I want them to come up all the time. I want every time somebody says diversity, I want that includes people with disabilities. That includes people who are deaf. Then I'll talk about diversity within the deaf community. Because within the deaf community, we have all of the diversity that's out there in the world, but we also have many additional differences. Within the deaf community, there are many different ways to be deaf. There are many different degrees of deafness. There are many different ways to communicate and many different ways to be educated and to educate. And so it's like uh, diversity doubled or tripled or something. It's really an add-on and an important difference. So let's talk about that. Deafness and disability. Need a new interpreter. Wait. Okay. <laughs> Deafness and disability define me. Deafness and disability really define me. I am disabled because I can't hear anything. I am deaf. I'm deaf and I'm proud. And um, I'm a proud deaf man. I'm a proud disabled man. So I don't want people to think that deafness or disability, that I confess, defines who I am. I don't want people to think that I feel negative or concerned or disappointed about that. I don't feel any of that. I feel, uh, I feel proud and I'm a very happy person. Sometimes I'm too happy a person. But uh, it's, it's not like I see there's something wrong with me. There's physically, there's something very seriously wrong with me. My ears don't work. So, you know, obviously that's wrong. But I don't feel like there's something wrong with me. I feel right. <laughs> right, that's what I feel. I have a really wonderful opportunity to travel a lot and to speak a lot. We're here in Asheville, and a few days ago we were in Columbia, South Carolina, and I spoke at a conference there. A few days before that, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, and I spoke at CDC there. I speak at universities, I speak at government agencies. I, I always speak about the rights and abilities of people who are deaf and people who are disabled. And I try really hard to focus on the abilities and not the dis. So disability, okay, but when you say the word disability, you don't say disability, you say disability. So the ability is much stronger than the this. That's important. I became deaf on April 23rd. That's very specific because I became deaf in an accident, as a result of an accident. So one afternoon I was a hearing person and that night I was a deaf person because of an accident. That April 23rd was 1965. So last April I celebrated my 47th deaf birthday. <laughs> and uh, I think about that, I've been a deaf person a lot longer than I've been a hearing person. I want to make sure I say 
up front that I hope there's time for questions when my presentation is over. I learn a lot from questions. And one of the things I often learn from questions is what I forgot to say or what I should have said and didn't say. So frequently people ask me questions that give me the opportunity to say something important that I forgot. Frequently people will ask me questions or make comments that are very educational for me and for the audience. So I'll try to keep my presentation short enough that there's plenty of time for questions. Dr. Fernandez told me she'll come back up and explain how we'll deal with the mixed audience and the question and answer period. So let me talk a little bit about diversity, where I use diversity to include deafness and disability within the normal human condition. Being deaf is just one part of normal human. Being disabled is just one aspect of being a normal human. Historically, that's not true. Historically, the uh, study, study of people with disabilities or the study of people who are deaf was very negative. I used to teach a course at Gallaudet called Psychology and Deafness. And that course, one of the first things I would do is ask the students to go to the library and look up old studies about deafness. Look up old books about deaf people and make a list of words people use to describe deaf people. And it's really sad to look at the list that people use to describe deaf people. Almost all of the adjectives are negative. You know, poor self-control or poor impulse control or immature or the list all of these characteristics of deaf people that are not very positive characteristics, that's changing. That's changing. The good news is that's changing. But historically, people focus just on what deaf people couldn't do. You know, can hear, let's focus on working to either fix the broken hearing or find a way to compensate for it. You know, teach things in a way to help the deaf person or help the disabled person. The whole rehab movement, vocational rehab, that whole movement is a helping movement, historically, historically. Now it's changing. Now there's a lot better recognition that People who are deaf are whole. And deafness is just one aspect of their lives. And we should focus on the whole person and not just on the person's broken hearing. It's interesting if you look at those books and you look at language people use to describe deafness, you still see deaf and dumb. You still see that. Every time I see deaf and dumb, it's like somebody on a blackboard. You know, the how can people say that now? You know, how? Or talk about the trapped in a wheelchair. A uh, person's not trapped in a wheelchair. A person uses a wheelchair to get around. That's a much easier and more positive way to describe that. But still, in 2012, you still see things like that. If I use myself as an example tonight, if there's no interpreter, I'm disabled. If there's no interpreter and I'm trying to talk to a hearing person, I'm disabled. I really can't lip read well. I, I'm, I was looking for a, a word to substitute that sign. <laughs> that's 
sometimes ASL works, and it's hard to find an English equivalent, but I am a lip reader. I, <laughs> I think even if you don't know sign language, you got it, right? I'm, I'm not a good lip reader. I, uh, I taught a class this morning that the one thing I can lip read really well is, do you read lips? <laughs> do you read lips? And when I meet a new hearing person, that's always the first question. Do you read lips? I love to say no. <laughs> and watch the reaction to your uh, lips. <laughs> no. But here, I'm not. I'm not disabled because there are interpreters. So among the deaf people, I can freely and easily talk. When I meet a hearing person, then with an interpreter, I can freely and easily talk. But away from here, where I have no interpreters, it's completely different. I went to Ohio State University once to speak. And I stayed in their campus hotel, nice hotel. I'm sorry, I should have said. I went to the Ohio State University. They're really, psh, they're <laughs> the Ohio State University. And I stayed in their hotel. Then I got up in the morning before I was scheduled to meet my first meeting. Got up in the morning and went down to the restaurant for breakfast. And I remember the restaurant was the Bistro. That was the name of the restaurant, Bistro. So I went down to breakfast, and this young man, who I assume was a student, came up to wait on me. Nice, friendly, good morning. My name's Steve. I'm happy to help you this morning. I said, hi, Steve. I just want to let you know I'm a deaf man. Steve froze. <laughs> uh, it was like I tasered him. <laughs> no, because <laughs> he, he had no idea what to do. And you know, he didn't need to do anything. He needed to bring me my breakfast, bring me coffee when my coffee cup was empty. That's all he needed to do. But he was honest, honest. He was paralyzed with uh, ignorance. Now, I, I use that word carefully, ignorance. I just mean a lack of knowledge. He had no knowledge, no experience, never met a deaf person before, so he had no idea what to do. Well, we got through breakfast, but it was pretty cool for me because I was speaking later that day, so I used our encounter in my speech because it happens that the restaurant on campus at Gallaudet is called the Bistro. Same name, restaurant. And if you go to the Bistro at Gallaudet and you're a hearing person, you're in trouble <laughs> because the wait staff, the chef, the people who work at the front desk, they'll sign. If you show up and you don't sign, you're in the minority. So you know what they do at Gallaudet? I don't know if they still do it, what they used to do at the bistro. They had a uh, paper and pen on the table for the hearing people who couldn't communicate with the waiter. So <laughs> you're stuck. Help the hearing people communicate with the waiter. I, I use that example because I want to show you how context, context defines disability. It's not the physical issue as much as the social construction that defines the disability. If the social construction that's there is limiting, then you're disabled. If the social construction that's there is not limiting, then you're not. And it's really simple, it's really easy. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we've been focusing on the individual's problem and how to remediate the individual problem or find a way around the individual problem when the problem's not with the individual, the problem's with the context. 
So if we fix the context, then we fix the disability. And I think about that and I say to myself, you know, isn't that cool? <laughs> isn't that really wonderful? Why don't people realize this? And people don't. People really don't. People still focus on the problem. So part of my current joy in life is traveling and preaching that message. And, you know, this month is Disability Employment Awareness Month. That means every government agency all over the country must set up a program to look into how to better help serve people with disabilities. And when I have the opportunity to talk to them, I say, don't focus so much on people with disabilities. Focus on your community. Focus on the whole agency. Focus on what you can do to improve the design of the whole agency. Focus on communication between and among everybody, not just between a supervisor and a deaf employee or a deaf supervisor and a hearing employee, but focus on the whole thing. Uh, one, one more experience I want to share about the context and about ignorance. And again, I'll say I use that word ignorance carefully. I was at a hotel waiting to check in to the hotel. And there was a line of about three or four people. It was not that bad, but it was not right away. You know, it was a line, three or four people, and just, just one person working behind the desk. So it gave me the opportunity to look at that person to see how that person talked and communicated. And from three people back, oh, I could lip read her. You know, you know, some people just happen to be really easy to lip read. So I stood and watched. This is great because I'll have an easy time with her. So person went, another person went. Then I went up there, and while she was working with me, the phone rang, and she had to do something looking down with the pen. So she was looking down with the pen, and she kept talking to me. So I said, well, I really can't understand you if you look down because I'm deaf, and I need to see you. So when you're looking at me, it's fine, but when you look down, I lose you. Then she was almost like that waiter. You know, when she knew I was deaf, she changed. Before she knew I was deaf, she was very easy to lip read. After she knew I was deaf, she tried to help me understand her speech. And she tried so hard, I couldn't understand her. So she really made things worse. Now, her heart was in the right place. She was trying. She, she really wanted to help me, but she wasn't helping me. She just made things worse. And we ended up writing. You know, so I could understand her. So that's really a great example of context. You know, before she knew, everything was right. After she found out, everything went south. It was not, not a good thing. I, uh, I talked about design. You Do not litter. <laughs> I talked about design, and there's a new concept called universal design. What's well, not really new, but there's a growing concept called universal design, where people design environments and social settings so that everybody can benefit. And that's a really good thing. If people pay attention to universal design, that works. When people use the phrase universal design, most of the time they think about architecture. And it's much more than just architecture. And a great example of universal design is a true story about a high school girl in the Midwest 
who used a wheelchair. And that high school girl went to school one morning after it snowed. So when she got to school in her wheelchair, she wheeled up to the front, and the custodian was shoveling the steps, not the ramp. So she asked him, why are you shoveling the steps and not the ramp? And he said, honey, I'm really busy, and I can't possibly do both. And she said, well, why don't you shovel the ramp first? Then everybody can get in. And you know, of course, of course, people who use the steps can use the ramp, but no, no one thinks of that. That's a good example of universal design, universal thought. And you can have experiences in your life where I hope maybe going forward you'll think, wow, here's a chance for me to do something or say something that's universal, that's inclusive, that helps people feel like they're welcome and included. Shane talked about ADA and how I had a role in helping foster ADA through Congress. I did, and I'm proud. And some of the things that ADA has done, who remarkable benefit. Now, I look out right now. Tonight, I see many deaf people, but I also see many people who are not deaf and don't know much about deafness. So let me talk for one minute about how I make phone call, OK? Uh, first, a little bit of background. I said I've been married for 44 years. For 35 years of that marriage, I never talked to my wife on the phone. Never. Never used a telephone. I was a college professor, and she was an elementary school teacher. And we get up in the morning and kiss goodbye and go to work. And then the next time we communicated was at home after work was over. We, we just didn't talk on the phone. Now I can make phone calls just the same as anyone else. And I can make those phone calls because of ADA. ADA has one subsection. It's it's called Title IV that requires a national telecommunication relay system. When that telecommunication relay system was set up in 1989, 1990, about then, it was using TTYs. TTYs. So I want to make a phone call. I type on my TTY to a communication assistant who would then make a phone call. That person would talk to the communication assistant. she type back to me. I'd type back to her. It worked, but it was slow and uh, difficult. Now I use what's called VRS, video relay system. And that's really an amazing thing. When I want to make a phone call, now, suppose I want to make a phone call. I'll call my wife. I punch in her number on my phone system. There's a small camera on my TV. Then instead of calling her, it calls an interpreter. And that interpreter shows up on my TV. And I, because I can't speak, well, I use my own voice when I make a telephone call. So she calls Linda, and I watch, and I see the interpreter say, hello. I know that Linda has said hello to the interpreter. So I say, hi. I know we're supposed to meet for dinner at 5.30, but something came up. I'm not going to be able to be there at 5.30, so can we put it off till 7 o'clock? I meet you at 7 o'clock at the same place. Is that all right? Oh, King, that's the third time in this week that you've delayed dinner. And, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And it's a perfectly normal phone call. 
it really, the interpreters are good. The interpreters are really good. And they help me see emotion. They help me see speed of conversation. I know if somebody's mad at me. I, uh, I know if somebody's disappointed in my uh, conversation. Once I made a phone call to a university because I was reference for a person who was applying for a position there. So I called the person on the committee that was doing the uh, interviews and talked about this individual who was applying for the job for an hour and a half, an hour and a half. Long conversation. I really enjoyed the conversation. He asked me good questions and good follow-up questions. And I tried to give him good answers. And so it was fun conversation with this guy. So after an hour and a half, we finished the conversation. We, he was about to hang up. And he said, Dr. Jordan, I hesitate to say this, but I was told you were a deaf man. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, I'm a deaf man. He said, how can a deaf man have a telephone conversation <laughs> like this? So then I told him how the, uh, the telephone system worked. But that's evidence of how good the system works. It really helps me make phone calls. Is this important? Hugely important. Lots of times, people have jobs where they can't get promotions because they can't use the telephone. Or people apply for jobs and they're not offered the job. They're not hired because the supervisor says, how we work, can't use the telephone. So now that excuse is gone. And oftentimes, a deaf person used to have to ask a neighbor for help with the telephone. Or I can remember if I wanted pizza, I would drive to buy a pizza, then have to wait 30 minutes while they start from scratch. But now I can call and then drive, and when I get there, the pizza's already done. And you know, that's simple, it's so simple, it's almost silly. But hey, for 70, 80, 90 years, deaf people couldn't do that, and now they can. So ADA is really great in that regard. But ADA and other laws are good, but they're not enough. They're not enough. What's a lot more important is what's in people's minds and in people's hearts. And I talk about for deaf people, the big barrier is the communication barrier. But honest, that's just one barrier. Another big barrier is attitudinal barrier. Uh, the attitude that people who are deaf or people who are disabled are less able. People who are deaf are not as capable as people who can hear. And I fight that all the time. I fight that. I know that every deaf person in this room fights that. And I hope that every hearing person in this room, when you leave, you'll help us fight that too. Because the laws are good. The laws help a lot with progress and with equal access. But equality, real full equality, won't happen until people change their beliefs, change their attitudes, and change their minds. I said I would talk about two different kinds of diversity. I haven't yet talked about diversity within the deaf community. There are lots and lots and lots of different kinds of deaf people. There are many different ways to be deaf. I grew up hearing. I became deaf when I was 21. 
when I was 18 or 19, I never met a deaf person. I didn't know anything about deafness. When I became deaf, I was lucky I became deaf in Washington, D.C. So my accident was right in Washington, D.C., right down the street from Gallaudet College. So I was able to enroll in Gallaudet College. Uh, don't think that was an easy thing to do. <laughs> I was deaf in my ears, but I, I couldn't sign. I couldn't fingerspell. I couldn't understand signs. My first class was a chemistry class. And my chemistry professor, he looked like a chemistry professor out of a textbook or a movie or something. He had a white lab coat, you know, for a lecture. He had a white lab coat. And he came out in front of the blackboard and he started, you no. Know, his lecture, there was no speech at all in his lecture. It was straight ASL. It was 8 o'clock on a Monday morning. I thought, oh, sweet me. I'm not <laughs> going to make it here. How will I ever succeed in this uh, environment? But, but some of the people I got out, were really helpful, really, really helpful to me. They helped me slowly learn signs. They were patient with my signs. I said some of the people I got at, some of the people I got at had no patience for that. They really didn't want anything to do with the, that's a, a sign, the sign for hearing, that's, Fine, hearing, that means you people who are not deaf, hearing, hearing. This sign is making the hearing sign up here. It means, like, thinks like hearing person. It means deaf, but. So when I was there, I was both, and that. That means oral, in an exaggerated way, it means that uh, and means hearing. But I was there three years. And after three years, I really learned to become a deaf person. And it was a big, big help to me. So for that, I owe God that, and I owe many of the people who were friendly and supportive, and that happens all the time. So there are people like me. There are people who are born in families where the parents are deaf, the grandparents are deaf, the sisters and brothers are deaf. So born, the first language you see is sign language. And those children acquire language really early, earlier than hearing children learn to speak. Deaf children in signing homes learn to sign. So there's people like that. There are people who were born deaf, but for whatever reason chose not to learn sign. So they grow up in regular schools with an oral education, and they work, and they're very happy in their lives, but they don't sign. When I meet people like that, sometimes we have a hard time communicating. And 15 or 20 years ago, we wouldn't even have tried to communicate. Now there's a lot more flex there, I think, and people do try to communicate. So there are many kinds of communication, many kinds of education. People who go to regular public school where there are one deaf person in a classroom, people who go to public schools, but there's whole class of deaf children, people who go half a day to public school and half a day to a deaf school, people who go to a deaf school all their lives. I think it's a wonderful mix, but it's something that people outside the deaf community don't begin to understand. People outside the deaf community, 
if they know a deaf person, then they automatically think all oh, deaf people are like that. Or maybe they'll see a deaf character on TV. Then they'll think all oh, deaf people are like that character on TV. And we're all over the map. There are many, many different ways to be deaf. I sign and speak. Some people have really strongly criticized my decision to sign and speak and tell me you should either sign or speak, but you should never do both. And I say, well, thanks for your opinion, but you know, I will decide how I will communicate. You decide how you communicate. I will respect your decision on how you do it, I would hope that you would respect my decision on how I do it. And part of the crossroads issue is that more and more that respect's not there. More and more there's oppression both ways and more and more people are criticizing, openly criticizing communication decisions and education decisions. And I don't like that. I don't like I don't like someone to say, this is the right path. We will all follow this path. It's not true. It's the right path for him. Good. It's not the right path for me. So allow everybody to make their own decisions that will help resolve a lot of the disputes that are out there. I said I became a deaf person. I got that. I did. I, I also got a really outstanding education. And I learned something really important about college education. And that lesson I learned about college education is you get what you deserve in a college education. You get back what you put in to a college education. So I went to graduate school after Gallaudet. I went to, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that here out loud. I went to the University of Tennessee. Is that okay? <laughs> University of Tennessee. I, uh, I went to the University of Tennessee. It was our first real experience in South. It was, uh, was a, a great experience there. But they had a practice that was really an iffy practice. That practice was they would accept almost twice as many students as they could handle, knowing that about half would fail out in the first year. So really, half of the first year graduate students never made it to the second year, never finished their PhD. And I was really concerned because, you know, this guy went to the University of Chicago. This guy went to UCLA. This woman went to Yale. I went to Gallaudet. You know, can I compete with people who went to Yale? Uh, I don't know. And the answer was yes, I could because I had good professors and great textbooks and a great library, and I worked hard and studied hard. So when I left with that BA, I had a real honest to goodness BA. I try to tell that to high school students now. Where you go is not as important as what you do when you get there. You can get a great education almost anywhere but it's up to you. you uh, they, they won't give you a great education at Harvard. They won't. You, if you get a great education at Harvard, it's because you earned it. It's because you worked hard for it. They won't give you a great education at UNCA. Nope. They, they don't give educations. They 
provide opportunities for you to get an education, and that's big, big difference. I taught psychology for 15 years, and I loved teaching. I loved classes. I got it. I loved the preparation for teaching. I loved the interaction with the students. And then when I became president, I really had to stop teaching. Part of the reason why I had to stop teaching is because I traveled so much. And part of the reason why I traveled so much is that when I became president, because it was so public and so many people saw what happened, I became like a spokesperson, spokesperson for the rights of deaf people and the rights of people with disabilities. So I was invited to speak, and I knew I had to capitalize on that. So I traveled and spoke, and I really liked it. And I liked the role of advocating for the rights of people who are deaf. And I liked my job as president. But there were really two jobs, and they were really different jobs. So when I had been president for 18 years, and we had developed a new strategic plan, I thought it was a good time for me to step down as president. I enjoyed both jobs, and I think I did them both well, but I could better continue if I just focused on advocacy. So that's what I do right now. I am a full-time advocate for the rights and abilities of people who are deaf and people who are disabled. And I hope that my message has helped you think a little bit about the abilities of people who are deaf and the abilities of people who are disabled. And I hope it's made you think a little bit about your attitudes and your behaviors and what your attitudes and behaviors will be like going forward. I, I haven't had the opportunity to talk in front of students, deaf students, for years. So I appreciate the opportunity to do that. I appreciate your sitting through this long speech. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to meet all of you, and I hope that some of you will have questions for me. So I'll invite Dr. Fernandez back to explain how we're going to do questions, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, we will try to make the Q&A accessible to everyone will be a challenge. But we will try and we will adapt as we go forward. But if you are hearing, it would be helpful if you will walk up to the, that microphone to ask a question. If you are deaf so that the deaf people in the audience can see your question, it would help us if you would come up and stand here on the stage and ask. Okay, so deaf people come up here and hearing people speak in the mic. And then if we need to adapt that, we'll see how it goes. Okay? Okay with me. Okay. Does anyone have a question? <laughs> Oh. Hey. You're not paying attention. You're supposed to come up here. <laughs> um. well, I, I can hear. <laughs> so, um, but I was wondering if you could say something about how, as a student, we can uh, encourage the kind of diversity you're talking about here on campus. Can you speak up, please? Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, how can we, as students, encourage the kind of diversity you're talking about here on campus? Well, 
Today I attended a DAC meeting, the Diversity Action Committee here on campus. So I know that there's a group of people who are working very hard to do exactly that. And I know that they're developing curriculum that have classes that are called DI, I believe. DI means diversity intense. And I know that they would be very interested in hearing that you as a student want to know how you can help. So I suggest you get in touch with the provost's office because she coordinates the diversity action committee and I'm sure that they can help you find ways to help the campus. Okay? Thank you. Sure. So I want to go back because I saw his question, so I'll, just, I'll interpret your question, okay? I, I'll re I, I will repeat your question, okay? He asked me, are you writing a book? Oh. Off and on, off and on, I've tried to write a book. I've worked with people. I have a manuscript. I want to write a book. And I'm not there. I, I would love to write a book. A lot of really great things happened around me while I was president of Gallaudet. So I hope to write a book. I haven't given up but I don't have a publication date or anything like that. I, I want to, yes. I hope I can. Are you the president right now? No, I have stepped down currently. I, uh, I love my job as president, and I love traveling, too. And the reason I love both is I love my job because of the students. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Her question, while I was president, uh, how did I feel? Did I, did I love my job? Did I love travel? when I was president? And the answer is yes to both. <laughs> I love my job primarily because of students. I, I always would say my two favorite days at Gallaudet during the year are the first day when students arrive and we have a convocation and welcome the new students and then graduation when they leave. And it was really a great, well, not because they're leaving, but because you could see the growth. You could see, you could see a new person walk across the stage. The come to Gallaudet, they were 17, 18 years old, and kids who would come to Gallaudet, when they graduated from Gallaudet, they were young men and women who were ready to go out in the world and do important things. And I thought, we helped them do that. We provided the environment and the opportunity to help them grow, so I love doing that. Travel I love because I could tell the God that story, and I could tell the disability story, and I could talk about the abilities of people who are deaf and the abilities of people who are disabled. And surprisingly, many, many audiences know nothing about disability or deafness. So it was a good opportunity for me. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I want to ask you a question about advocacy. I am a hard of hearing person. I wear hearing aids. It's a subtle disability, but it is a disability. I am wondering how we can get insurance companies, Medicare, such agencies to actually insure 
us so that we can get hearing aids more easily? That's really a wonderful question. And there's a lot of work advocating to try to make that happen. But the, the answer is not simple, especially right now with uh, the costs of Medicare and with the costs of insurance. But you know, it's really ironic, I think, if you have a cochlear implant, yes. much of the cost of that will be paid by insurance. But if you have hearing aids, which cost a tiny fraction of cochlear implant, insurance won't pay a dime for it. It's, uh, it's really not fair. And I'm happy you identified yourself as hard of hearing because I didn't do a very good job of including hard of hearing people in my comments. I think hard of hearing people have really unique challenges. And, and their challenges are as important as the challenges that profoundly deaf people have. They're just different. So one is a financial challenge of paying for hearing aids and batteries and so forth. And I really would hope that sometime that might happen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a student learning ASL, and I can hardly imagine losing my hearing. I think it was very brave of you to enter an entirely an in college with an entirely deaf community. Besides learning a brand new language, what was the hardest challenge you had to, well, what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome? Okay. Uh, this will probably surprise you, but the most difficult issue was becoming deaf. Uh, I was in the Navy, the Navy, when I became deaf. I was in the military. So I went to a military hospital, and they didn't know anything about deafness. And they thought, or at least they told me they thought, that I would become hearing dumb, that my deafness was a temporary thing. So for a long time, I didn't identify myself as deaf. I didn't think of myself as deaf. I thought of myself as a hearing person who couldn't hear. So my biggest challenge was inside. My biggest challenge was to recognize that, uh, hey, King, this uh, looks like it's for the long term. Uh, <laughs> doesn't look like it's going to go away. So, so I had to become a deaf man instead of a hearing man who couldn't hear. And that was my, my biggest challenge. But honestly, going to God, that was not brave. Uh, I thought I was in the Navy. In the Navy, I learned very quickly that I should have had more education. The, uh, the military, people who have education are officers. People who don't have education are not officers. And no matter how competent or not competent the officers are, they're officers. And you do what they say. And yes, sir. So I learned in the Navy I'd better get an education. Then when I became deaf, I thought, how am I going to get an education? Well, hello, there's a college here for deaf people, so I'll, I'll go there. It may have been brave to stay there at the beginning. It was, it was hard at the beginning, but it got better and better and better and better and better. Thank you. So can I suggest that the guy, there's a guy back there with crutches who might not be able to get up easily to the microphone. Can, oh, I thought, you, I thought, you, are you asking a question with the, no, but back, with the orange shirt or are you just, no? Turn around backwards. Okay, never mind. Come on. <laughs> Dr. Jordan, 
I just wanted to say thank you for the method of communication that you chose to have in signing and communicating via voice. I'm not a deaf person, and before tonight, I have not heard of you, but after tonight, I will not forget you. And you have helped me to realize that no matter what capacity we are or serve in life, we can all learn from each other. So I appreciate being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to end. <laughs> what a wonderful comment to make. I, I'm touched very much by your comment. Thank you. I'm touched by the reception I feel I've received here tonight. I'm delighted to have had the opportunity to talk with you, and I hope to have the opportunity to say hello to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.